Okay, so this week's episode is going to be pretty good. Uh, we talk a lot about, um, a lot from the book of Isaiah, and, uh, and uh, some talk about the uh, philosophers. So, uh, I hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Okay, here's where we left off last time. We left off here at the end of this one. Now we're starting into a new part. Responsibility asserted. But lest some suppose, from what has been said by us, that we say that whatever happens, happens by fatal necessity, because it is foretold as known beforehand. This too we explain. We have learned from the prophets, and we hold it to be true that punishments and chastisements and good rewards are rendered according to the merit of each man's actions. Since if it be not so, but all things happen by fate, neither is anything at all in our own power. For if it be fated that this man, example, be good, and this other evil, neither is the former meritorious nor the latter to be blamed. And again, unless the human race have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, of whatever kind they be, but that it is by free choice they both walk uprightly and stumble, we thus demonstrate. We see that the same man making a transition to opposite things. Now if it had been fated that he were to be either good or bad, he could never have been capable of both the opposites, nor of so many transitions. But not even would some be good and others bad, since we thus make fate the cause of evil. See, he's here... Uh, debating the causes of fate that philosophers talk about. So he's saying men have to have choice, a free choice. So thus we, since we thus make fate the cause of evil and exhibit her as acting in opposition to herself, or that which has been already stated would seem to be true, that neither virtue nor vice is anything, but that the things are only reckoned good or evil by opinion, which, as the true word shows, is the greatest impiety and wickedness. But this, we assert, is inevitable fate, that they who choose the good have worthy rewards, and they who choose the opposite have their merited awards. For not like other things, as trees and quadrupeds, which cannot act by choice, did God make man. For neither would he be worthy of reward or praise, did he not of himself choose the good. But were created for this end. Nor if he were evil would he be worthy of punishment, but being evil of himself, but being able to be nothing else than what he was made. So it's sort of a strange kind of talking or layout of his words. But he's just uh, arguing against the teaching of unchangeable fate, which is taught by philosophers and saying that the true word of God teaches that we have choice and those who choose good go to uh, heaven, and those who choose evil get punished accordingly. So, next chapter. And the Holy Spirit of prophecy taught us this, telling us by Moses that God spoke thus to the man first created, Behold, before your face are good and evil. Choose the good. And again, by the other prophet, Isaiah, that the following utterance was made as if from God the Father and Lord of all. Wash you, make you clean, put away evils from your souls, learn to do well, 
judge the orphan, and plead for the widow, and come and let us reason together, says the Lord. And if your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as wool, and if they be red as crimson, I will make them white as snow. And if you be willing and obey me, you shall eat the good of the land, but if you do not obey me, the sword shall devour you. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Isaiah 1.16, etc. That's like, and other parts of Isaiah. Because um, these old Christians, like I said before, they, team, they tend to uh, quote from several parts of, the, of a book, like the book of Isaiah. And they say, thus says the scriptures. And they'll just take certain quotes and add them together. Because he's just going by his memory. They didn't have chapter and verse numbers. And he's just saying, the book says this and this and this. Okay, and that expression, the, show, the sword shall devour you, does not mean that the disobedient shall be slain by the sword, but the sword of God is fire, which they who choose to do wickedly become the fuel. Wherefore, he says, the, sh the sword shall devour you, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. And if he had spoken concerning a sword that cuts and at once dispatches, he would not have said, shall devour. And so this too, Plato, when he says the blame is his who chooses, and God is blameless, took this from the prophet Moses and uttered it. For Moses is more ancient than all the Greek writers. And whatever both philosophers and poets have said, concerning the immortality of the soul, or punishments after death, or contemplation of things heavenly, or doctrine, doctrines of the like kind, they have received such suggestions from the prophets as have enabled them to understand and interpret these things. And hence there seem to be seeds of truth among all men but they are charged with not accurately understanding the truth when they assert contradictories. So that what we say about future events being told, foretold, we do not say it as if they came about by fatal necessity, but God foreknowing all that shall be done by all men, and it being his decree that the future actions of men shall all be recompensed, According to their several value, he foretells by the spirit of prophecy that he will bestow meet rewards according to the merit of the actions done, always urging the human race to effort and recollection, showing that he cares and provides for men, but by the agency of the devil's death has been decreed against those who read the books of Histapes or of the Sibyl, or of the prophets, that through fear they may prevent men who read them from receiving the knowledge of the good, and may retain them in slavery to themselves, which, however, they could not always effect. For not only do we fearlessly read them, but as you see, bring them for your inspection, knowing that their contents will be pleasing to all. So he's saying that the uh, the demons uh, were were uh, fooling the prophets into not reading those books and telling people about those books, and now he's showing them to the Roman Senate. So the demons have failed, and the prophets actually influenced the uh, philosophers, the Greek philosophers like Plato. And we fearlessly read them. Uh, and if we persuade even a few, our gain will be very great. For as good hus husbandmen, we shall receive the reward from the Master. Christ's session in heaven foretold. 
and that God the Father of all would bring Christ to heaven after he had raised him from the dead and would keep him there until he has subdued his enemies, the devils, and until the number of those who are foreknown by him as good and virtuous is complete, on whose account he has still delayed the consummation. Hear what is said by the prophet David. These are his words. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send to you the rod of power out of Jerusalem and rule you in the midst of your enemies. With you is, is the government in the day of your power and the beauties of your saints. From the womb of the morning I have begotten you. Okay, here it is here, the Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. That's out of Jerusalem. Mount Zion is another name for uh, Jerusalem. Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your, your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he is talking about Jesus. And uh, that's what Justin Martyr is uh, quoting here that which he says he shall, he shall send to you the rod of power out of Jerusalem is predictive of the mighty word which his apostles going forth from Jerusalem preached everywhere and through death and though death is decreed against those who teach or at all confess the name of Christ we everywhere both embrace and teach it. And if you also read these words in a hostile spirit, you can do no more, as I said before, than kill us, which indeed does no harm to us, but to you and all who unjustly hate us, and do not repent, and do not repent brings eternal punishment by fire. Okay, so... The word of the the word in the world before Christ. Oh, this is interesting. He's going to talk about the logos, I think. But lest some should, without reason and for the perversion of what we teach, maintain that we say that Christ was born 150 years ago under Cyrenius, and subsequently, in the time of Pontius Pilate, taught what we say he taught and should cry out against us as though all men were born before him, were irresponsible, let us anticipate and solve the difficulty. We have been taught that Christ is the firstborn of God, and we have declared above that he is the word of whom every race of men were partakers, and those who lived reasonably are Christians, even though they have been thought atheists as among the Greeks so he's saying that they believed before Christ all who lived reasonably are Christians even though they have been taught atheists or thought atheists as among the Greeks Socrates and Heraclitus and the men like him and among the barbarians, Abraham and Ananias and Azarias and Misul and Elias and many others whose actions and names we now decline to recount because we know it would be tedious. So that even they who lived before Christ and lived without reason were wicked and hostile to Christ and slew those who lived reasonably but who, through the power of the word, according to the will of God, the Father and Lord of all, 
He was born a virgin as a man and was named Jesus and was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven. An intelligent man will be able to comprehend from what has been already so largely said. And we, since the proof of this subject is less needful now, will pass for the present to the proof of those things which are urgent. So he's saying this isn't important to discuss. But what he's saying is there's always been a struggle of those who re live reasonably and those who live unreasonably and, and the ones unreasonable ones kill the reasonable ones. So this, this um, paradigm has always been in the world. It's just um, shown and exposed by Christ. And that it has always been this a spirit of Christ, you could say. A de desolation of Judea foretold. That the land of the Jews then was to be laid waste. Hear what is said by the spirit of prophecy. And the words were spoken as if from the person of the people wandering at what had happened. They are these. Zion is a wilderness, Jerusalem a desolation. The house of our sanctuary has become a curse, and the glory which our fathers bless is burned up with fire, and all its glorious things are laid waste, and you refrain yourself at these things, and have held your peace, and have humbled us very sore. That's Isaiah 64, 10-12. And you are convinced that Jerusalem has been laid waste as was predicted. And concerning its desolation, and that no one should be permitted to inhabit it, there was the following prophecy by Isaiah. Their land is desolate, their enemies consume it before them, and none of them shall dwell therein. Isaiah 1.7 and that it is guarded by you, lest anyone dwell in it. And that death is decreed against a Jew apprehended entering it, you know very well. So Rome is guarding Jer Jerusalem so that nobody can dwell in it. And no Jew is allowed to go there. So he's saying this is a fulfillment of the prophecy. Isaiah 1.7 Let's take a look at it. Now we know Isaiah prophesied before the first destruction of Jerusalem. And um, a lot of those prophecies also apply to the second destruction. It's like a recycling of prophecy. Isaiah 1, 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers, devour it in your presence. And it is desolate, as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, and as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant. We should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of your God, you people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or lambs or he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity. Even the solemn meeting, 
your, moon, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. How has the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. So, you see, God hasn't changed. Um, he was prophesying this long ago. And it's about Jesus and about doing what is right more than doing sacrifice. Okay, so there. Uh, now Christ's work and death fulfilled. And that it was pre predicted that our Christ should heal all diseases and raise the dead. Hear what was said. These are the, these. There are these words. At his coming the lame shall leap as a heart, and the tongue of the stammerer shall be clear speaking. The blind shall see, and the lepers shall be cleansed, and the dead shall rise and walk about. Isaiah 35, 6. And he that did those things, you can learn from the acts of Pontius Pilate, which are destroyed now, and how it was predicted by the spirit of prophecy that he and those who hoped in him should be slain. Hear what was said by Isaiah. These are the words, Behold, now the righteous perishes, and no man lays it to heart, and just men are taken away, and no man considers from the presence of wickedness is a righteous man taken, and his burial shall be in peace. He is taken from our midst. Isaiah 57, 1. Now this is really interesting that uh, Justin Martyr He's relying heavily on Isaiah. He's he's um, he's uh, showing other prophets and showing some psalms, but he really showing a lot of Isaiah. And Isaiah was uh, very popular at the time of Christ. That's why the Isaiah scroll is the most complete Dead Sea scroll. And it's found that it hasn't been changed at all from what we have now. And that was about dated about 100 BC, I think. So um, it's interesting to see even Justin, that the Christian tradition also is relying heavily on Isaiah. Like more heavily than other prophets. Because it's a, it's a very messianic prophet, Isaiah. Okay. His rejection by the Jews are full, is foretold. And again, how is it said by the same Isaiah that the Gentile nations who are not looking for him should worship him, but the Jews who always expected him should not recognize him when he came? And the words are spoken as from the person of Christ, and they are these. I was manifest to them that asked not for me. I was found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me to a nation that called not on my name. I spread out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people, to those who walked in a way that is not good, but follow after their own sins, a people that provokes me to anger to my face. 
That's Isaiah 65, 1 to 3. For the Jews, having the prophecies, and being always in expectation of the Christ to come, did not recognize him, and not only so, but even treated him shamefully. But the Gentiles, who had never heard anything about Christ, until the apostles set out from Jerusalem and preached concerning him and gave them the prophecies, were filled with joy and faith and cast away their idols and dedicated themselves to the unbegotten God through Christ. And that it was foreknown. That's interesting. The unbegotten God through Christ. So there's a, where's the mother of God idea in here. They dedicated themselves to the unbegotten God through Christ. And then it was foreknown that these infamous things should be uttered against those who confessed Christ. And that those who slandered him and said it was well to preserve the ancient customs should be miserable. Here what was br briefly said by Isaiah, it is this, Woe to them that call sweet bitter and bitter sweet. Isaiah 5.20 His humiliation predicted. But that having become man for our sakes, he endured to suffer, to be dishonored, and that he shall come again with glory. Hear the prophecies which relate to this. They are these. Because they delivered his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, he has borne the sin of many, and shall make intercession for the transgressors. For behold, my servant shall deal prudently, and shall be exalted, and shall be greatly extolled. As many were astonished at you, so marred shall your form be before men, and so hidden from them your glory, so shall many nations wonder, and the kings shall shut their mouths at him. For they to whom it was not told concerning him, and they who have not heard shall understand. O Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? We have declared before him as a child, as a root in dry ground. He had no form nor glory, and we saw him that there was no form nor comeliness. But his form was dishonored and marred more than the sons of men. A man under the stroke, and knowing how to bear infirmity, because his face was turned away, he was despised and of no reputation. It is he who bears our sins and is afflicted for us, yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. Every man is wandered in his own way. And he delivered him from our sins. And he opened not his mouth for all his affliction. He was brought as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before his shearer is dumb. So he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And you'll find that in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. And that's pretty much word for word on those. Accordingly, after he was crucified, even all his acquaintances forsook him, having denied him. Peter denied him three times, right? And afterwards, when he had risen from the dead and appeared to them and taught them to read the prophecies in which all these things were foretold as coming to pass, and when they had seen him ascending into heaven and had believed, 
and had received power sent thence by him upon them, and went to every race of men, they taught these things, and were called apostles. So this is what the apostles were teaching them, Isaiah, and the servant of Isaiah, and other prophecies that we know, the majesty of Christ. And that the spirit of prophecy might signify to us that he who suffers these things is an, is an ineffable origin and rules his enemies, he spoke thus, his generation who shall declare, because his life is cut off from the earth for their transgressions he comes to death, and I will give the wicked for his burial and the rich for his death, because he did no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, and the Lord is pleased to cleanse him from the stripe. If he be given for sin, your soul shall see his seed prolonged in days, and the Lord is pleased to deliver his soul from grief, to show him light, and to form him with knowledge, to justify the righteous who richly serves many, and he shall bear our iniquities. Therefore he shall inherit many, and he shall divide the spoil of the strong, because his soul was delivered to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and he was delivered up for their transgressions. Isaiah 53, 8-12. So that's, uh, he was in, He's continuing with Isaiah 53 here. Okay. Here too, how he was to ascend into heaven according to prophecy. It was thus spoken. Lift up the gates of heaven. Be opened that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. And how also he should come again out of heaven with glory. Hear what was spoken in reverence to this by the prophet Jeremiah. His words are, Behold, as the Son of Man, he comes in the clouds, clouds of heaven and his angels with him. And that's actually Daniel 7.13. So he's got Jeremiah and... Well, whatever, I don't know, he's got Jeremiah and Daniel mixed up. <coughs> but that is Daniel there. Behold, as the Son of Man, he comes in the clouds of heavens and his angels with him. Who is this King of Glory? Well, I, that, I recognize that. Let's see, where's that from? Lift up the gates of heaven. I usually just Google it, and it's a. You want to find it if you if you know a part of a verse and you want to find it in the Bible real quick, just Google it. <laughs> it's really easy. Uh, lift up the gates of heaven. Enter. There it is, Psalm 24, <laughs> 7 to 10. So now we'll go there. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and you lift up everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. Okay. So that is Psalms. Lift up the gates of heaven. He Be open that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? That's the Psalm 24. And then so he did say Jeremiah, but it was actually Daniel. You see, so he's going by memory here. And uh, 
they might not even have the scriptures to actually look them up. Okay. Certain fulfillment of prophecy. Since then we prove that all things which have already happened had been predicted by the prophets before they came to pass. We must necessarily believe also that, that, that those things which are in like manner predicted but are yet to come to pass shall certainly happen. For as the things which have already taken place came to pass when foretold, and even though unknown, so shall the things that remain, even though they be unknown and, is, and disbelieved, yet come to pass. For the prophets have proclaimed two advents of his, the one, that which is already past, when he came as a dishonored and suffering man, but the second, when according to prophecy, he shall come from heaven with glory, accompanied by his angelic host, when also he shall raise the bodies of all men who have lived, and shall clothe those of the worthy with immortality, and shall send those of the wicked endued with eternal sensibility into everlasting fire with the wicked devils, and that these things also have been foretold as yet to be, we will prove. By Ezekiel the prophet it is said, Joint shall be joined to joint, and bone to bone, and flesh shall grow again, and flesh shall grow again, and every knee shall bow to the Lord, and every tongue shall confess him. So Ezekiel 37 is the uh, flesh and bones joining together. And Isaiah 45 is that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And in what kind of sensation and punishment the wicked are to be, hear from what was said in like manner with reference to this. It is as follows. Their worm shall not rest, this is, sounds like Isaiah 66. And their fire shall not be quenched. Isaiah 66, 24. And then shall they repent, when it profits them not. And what the people of the Jews shall say and do, when they see him coming in glory, has been thus predicted by Zechariah the prophet. I will command the four winds to gather the scattered children, I will command the north wind to bring them, and the south wind to, that, that it keep not back. And then in Jerusalem there shall be a great lamentation, not the lamentation of mouths or lips, but the lamentation of the heart. And they shall rend not their garments, but their hearts. Tribe by tribe they shall mourn. Then they shall look on him whom they have pierced, and they shall say, why, O oh Lord, have you made us to err from your way? The glory which our fathers blessed has for us been turned into shame. Wow, okay, that's Zechariah. I know that in Zechariah he says that they shall um, look on him whom they have pierced. Well, let's see what he actually says. As in that day should, there shall be a great mourning as in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family, the family of the house of David and the wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, their wives apart. So all the families shall mourn. Yeah, it's, what he's saying is probably a collection of verses out of Zechariah and may, maybe even out of um, Isaiah. So it would take a long time to uh, look all of that up. I don't remember reading this though. Why, O oh Lord, have you made us to err from your way? The glory which our fathers bless has for us been turned to shame. 
I don't remember that anywhere. But this here is from Zechariah. So uh, I don't know about that. Summary of the prophecies. Though we could bring forward many other prophecies, we forbear, judging these sufficient for the persuasion of those who have ears to hear and understand, and considering also that those persons are able to see that we do not make mere assertions without being able to produce proof, like those fables that are told of the so-called sons of Jupiter. For with what reason should we believe of a crucified man that he is the firstborn of the unbegotten God, and himself will pass judgment on the whole human race, unless we had found testimonies concerning him published before he came and was born as a man, and unless we saw that things had happened accordingly, the devastation of the land of the Jews and men of every race persuaded by his teaching through the apostles and rejecting their old habits in which being deceived they had their conversation yea seeing ourselves too and knowing that the christian from among the gentiles are both more numerous and more true than those among the jews and samaritans for all other human races are called Gentiles by the spirit of prophecy, but the Jewish and Samaritan races are called the tribe of Israel and the house of Jacob. Yeah, because uh, Jesus went, he said, I'm only going to the house of Israel. He went to the Jews and the Samaritans. And the prophe prophecy in which it was predicted that there should be more believers from the Gentiles than from the Jews and Samaritans, we will produce. It ran thus, Rejoice, O barren, you that do not bear. Break forth and shout, you that do not travail, because many more are the children of the desolate than of her that has a husband. Isaiah 54. For all the Gentiles were desolate of the true God, serving the works of their hands. But the Jews and Samaritans, having the word of God, delivered to them by the prophets, and always expecting the Christ, did not recognize him when he came, except some few of, of whom the spirit of prophecy by Isaiah had predicted that they should be saved. He spoke as from their person. Unless the Lord has left us a seed, we should have been as Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah, Isaiah 1 9. For Sodom and Gomorrah are related by Moses to have been cities of ungodly men which God burned with fire and brimstone and overthrew, no one of their inhabitants being saved except a certain stranger, a Chaldean by birth, whose name was Lot with whom also his daughters were, were rescued. And those who care may yet see their whole country desolate and burned and remaining barren, and to show how those from among the Gentiles were foretold as more true and more believing, we will cite what was said by Isaiah the prophet. For he spoke as follows, Israel is uncircumcised in heart, but the Gentiles are uncircumcised in the flesh. I don't know where Isaiah says that. Uh, there, there is a part where he, he calls on, Pete, on the Jews, circumcise your hearts. I think that was in Isaiah. Let's just take a quick look and see if that produces any results. Jeremiah 9.26 Yeah, even though these nations are circumcised, all Israel has uncircumcised hearts. Okay. C. 
So many things, therefore, as these, when they are seen with the eye, are enough to produce a conviction and belief in those who embrace the truth and are not bigoted in their opinions, nor are governed, governed by their passions. How much is left here? Another video, I'd say. <laughs> Goes up to 68. He goes into a lot of stuff. Plato's doctrine of the cross. Plato's obligation to Moses. Origin of heathen mythology. Okay, that's, that's where we just finished. The summary of the prophets. So uh, I guess we're going to end it here. And next week we'll finish it off. We'll start with origin of heathen mythology. Talking about where the heathen, uh, the heathen mythology would be the Greco-Roman gods, Jupiter and Zeus and all that stuff. And um, he he get he'll get into the 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 philosophers and how they got some truth from Moses, but a lot of uh, lies from the devils. Okay, that's it for this week. We'll see you again next week with the final part, I hope, of uh, Justin's first apology.